Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we have the good fortune to be joined by Steve Wesley. He is the managing partner and founder of the Wesley Group, as well as being a former board member of Tesla. So I wanted to spend some time today chatting about that experience, um, as well as some of the stuff you guys are looking at with your fund and things like that. Uh, Steve, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate you taking the time. You bet. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Um, so let's start with the fund a little bit, just to give people some background on kind of what you are doing, what you've been doing. Um, as I said, former Tesla board member, but in 2007, I think you guys started the Wesley Group, $700 million assets under management right now. I know you just raised your fourth fund um, a couple months back, $300 million fund. So you want to just tell us a little bit about you know what you guys focus on from an investing perspective? Absolutely. So we're one of the earliest folks investing in clean tech. And as you may know, clean tech 1.0 didn't go that well for everybody. We were one of the few that did, did well. And that was partially based on being one of the earliest investors in Tesla, where I served on the board and chaired the audit committee uh, for the three years or uh, uh, served on the audit committee. What we have focused on now through our fund two and our fund three is the revolution in sustainable energy, the future of mobility and smart buildings. And what most people don't realize is all three of these things are integrally connected. So for the last hundred years, you were either an energy company over here, like a PG&E or Con Ed, or maybe an OL company. You're an auto company like GM, or maybe Tesla here, or you're in the building business like Honeywell or Siemens. And these three entities, they didn't care about each other. They're different worlds, different planets. Today, because of this revolution, in the lowered cost of sustainable energy, revolution in the cost of lower cost lithium ion batteries. Uh, there is now an arbitrage between vehicles, buildings, and utilities that will continue for the rest of our lives. So we're in the center of these three industries. The good news is not only do I think I know what I'm doing, but 22 of the world's largest energy auto and now airline and insurance and other companies have chosen to invest with this partly to get above market rates of return, but probably even more importantly, to serve as their early warning system for trends of the future. And here's the real punchline. Almost every firm in the world, from your utilities to your auto companies and so on, has to re-envision what business they're in. And if you will, we say, develop a new 21st century menu providing new toilet uh, technologies that are obsoleting entire industries. And Elon's probably the best case in point of that. Yeah, it's very interesting to hear you talk about that. I mean, that's the kind of stuff we always are talking about on Tesla Daily. And um, it's I think I was reading on your guys' site, it was very interesting to me that you talked specifically about these industries historically being very conservative. And I think that has presented an opportunity for disruption, like exactly what you're talking about. Um, do you think that it's becoming a little bit less conservative by force from that disruption over time. And maybe that's kind of what these companies are looking to you guys to you know, track for a little bit. You are brilliant to say that. That is absolutely what is happening. And the reason is, if you're a utility executive, you could wake up comfortably for the last hundred years and just know that you know the price of power is going up. The utility commission is going to guarantee you a certain rate and life is good. And if you're an auto company exec, you know, models are going to change and fuel efficiency will go up a little and, you know, the engines will get faster. And that's sort of the ball game. Now, the change of rapidity is going faster than ever and it's obsoleting everything that was done before. I, I joke about this, but it's true. When I grew up, you know, in the 60s, you know, my dad would say, son, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And in the 1900s, good advice. <laughs> Throw that out now. The advice for the future is, and it really comes from Steve Jobs, and it's my mantra, and that is, if you're not busy cannibalizing yourself today, someone else is. And that is what Elon Musk has done with the auto industry. That is why he is today the wealthiest person in human history. He realized how quickly change was going, and he generally speaking made the right bets and moved a little faster than anybody else. Sure. Yeah. That's a, quite the understatement on that, that last piece, piece for sure. Yeah. Um, so how did you guys get kind of involved in Tesla? Like how did it come across your radar? How did uh, you guys decide to invest? Like walk us through a little bit of that, that history. Well, here's where you're going to hear a story that's different from anybody else you've ever spoken to. 
So first, I've known Elon for 25 years. He's been to our home for dinner. Uh, I know his brother. I first knew him at his very, very first company 25 years ago. And he and his brother were just another guy that no one knew or cared about. So I've known him for a long time. Second, Tesla, by the way, it, it gets even more interesting. He reappeared again after his first company, which no one's ever heard of, sold it for about 25 million, which at the time, 25 years ago, was a big deal. He then went and did this crazy thing with uh, uh, Zoom and PayPal. And lo and behold, I had gone on to become the senior vice president of marketing, sales, business development, international, and M&A at eBay. So why do we care about that? Elon re-enters my life as we look at acquiring PayPal. And so I actually had a front row seat in helping make Elon wealthy enough uh, from the acquisition of PayPal to go off and launch Tesla. So I sort of put Elon out of my mind. I did better than I ever dreamed at eBay. And I had been very politically active, I was essentially drafted to run for controller and chief financial officer of the state of California. And so I was on the campaign trail. These two guys showed up at one of my, I think, fundraising events and said, gee, you ought to hear what we're doing. If you're going to be the CFO of the world's fifth biggest economy, we started this little company in San Carlos, and we're going to revolutionize the global auto industry out of a warehouse in San Carlos. Forget Detroit. That's over. And it's all about electric vehicles, and the firm's called Tesla. And it was Martin Everhart and Mark Tarpening, and they were the two original founders of Tesla. There was no Elon then. And I said, it sounds fascinating. I had had it. I have a 40 year background in energy. When I graduated from college, I had gone to work at the Department of Energy and Office of Conservation and Solar. And I knew this was coming. So instead of saying, revolutionizing the global auto industry, who are, <laughs> who are these, these nut jobs? It was like, I completely get it. And as controller, Interestingly enough, I'd served on the boards of CalPERS and CalSTRS, the two largest public pension funds in the world, because we'd started making, investing billions in this new green energy revolution. Because when I worked at the DOE, solar was completely out of the money. Uh, Jimmy Carter put it up in the White House, Ronald Reagan tore it down, and just no one was buying it. By 2007, the cost of solar had gone down so much, demand for solar was going through the ceiling. Simultaneously, the cost of lithium ion batteries began this precipitous cost down curve. And it's kind of hard to explain. It sounds complicated, but it really isn't. Two events happening together. Stark cost down curve of renewable energy. Stark cost down curve of lithium ion batteries together enables two things. First is the electrification of everything. And second is the advent of the entire global mobility industry. We can talk about this later, not just cars, but trucks, boats, and planes right behind it are going all electric. Best thing ever for the planet. Without Elon Musk, it still would have happened, but it might have taken another decade or two. In the course of human history, that might turn out to be a pretty important savings of time. We owe a lot to Elon, as difficult as he might be. <laughs> at times, at times. Um, so where did Elon kind of come in? Yeah. in, in that? daytime and nighttime. <laughs> sure. So when did Elon come in kind of in the picture in terms of your involvement, um, you know, with Tesla? Well, what happened is I began talking on the campaign trail, literally at every stop, that we're heading toward a world where human beings won't pay a penny for electricity because they're going to have solar on the roof or gasoline ever again. It was California companies like Tesla that were going to make this happen, and the public might be well served to have a guy from Silicon Valley who understood that. This got a lot of attention, so I was out uh, as sort of a champion for Tesla. Um, I won the race for controller. I served on the boards of Persian stirs. I helped sort of promote this green revolution wherever I could. I ran for governor in 2006, um, narrowly lost by 3%. My wife was delighted. We moved back to the Silicon <laughs> Valley. And literally before I left office, Elon called and said, Steve, uh, we need someone with your credentials financially to serve on the board. And by the way, would you be willing to serve on the audit committee? And I flew down, met Elon in the SpaceX office and said yes. 
Sounds follows. like a sounds like a relatively easy decision for you to make with you know your background and the experience that you have. It probably not a too hard of a sell for Milan, I'm guessing. Well, um, no, I mean I, I was already sold before you, and it was one of the best things I ever did. Most exciting, by the way, more ups and downs than I can ever tell you. Uh, being on the Tesla board was uh, more drama than you might imagine. <laughs> And I, I'm just going to say flat out, I believe Elon Musk is the Thomas Edison uh, and Steve Jobs of our times. Uh, can it be a pain in the ass? A huge pain in the ass. But what he's doing is historic. Sure. So uh, when when you guys were kind of going through that that period of time, obviously Tesla was you know very very different than it is today. Did was there any sense that this could be the future? You know. Was the ambition as high at that point? And I know it kind of originally started as like, hey, let's demonstrate the model and then hopefully others will follow suit. Yeah. So look, uh, we, we believed in the vision and I believed electric cars were going to happen. But I, I grew up in a sleepy little town called Menlo Park. When I grew up, there was nothing here. Now it's the headquarters for Facebook, this, that, more firms got started here, you can imagine. But San Carlos was even sleepier than Menlo Park. It's actually two little cities out and it kind of, suggest that the global auto industry might, the next generation was going to emanate from this beat up warehouse in San Carlos was utterly preposterous. People thought I was nuts. Uh, but I, I should also tell you, I had been teaching on the faculty at Stanford's Graduate School of Business um, 15 years earlier. And I quit my job one day and told my parents I'd seen the future and I was going to work for an online flea market. <laughs> And they said, son, you've lost your mind. And that turned out to be eBay. So the punchline is we're living in a new world. Forget my father's advice. Remember Steve Jobs' advice. Every industry is being cannibalized. And so we knew the auto industry was going electric. Elon will be remembered for that. It was all started by Mark Tarpening and uh, Martin Everhard. Don't forget to give these guys credit. But Elon's the guy that really took it mainstream. But the big news about Tesla, we can kind of come back to the future here, is being a leader in electric is just the first inning of what Elon's done. The second inning, which is equally historic, is to make every car connected because now he's starting to challenge Apple to be perhaps your primary connected device in the world. And people say, oh, you're, yeah, come on, your car is going to replace your cell phone. But increasingly, more and more functions can be done in the car. So first he makes cars electric, then he makes them connected. Then you get the next big thing that most people today don't even understand. And that is there's about to be a great shakeout in the auto industry because simply put, we're going to be selling fewer cars. And that's because more and more people are going to be doing automated riding and they won't need to buy one. At the same time, there's another 50 or 100 car manufacturers entering the market. So fewer cars, more entrants, there's going to be some chaos. And what happens? Uh, I teach on the faculty, it's graduate school of business. Uh, companies get valued on growth and, and profitability, gross margins. Elon, again, one step ahead of the game, has figured out how to sell OTA services, over-the-air services. So he has engineered in a cost advantage over everybody else. And that's huge. By the way, instead of three ways, one, he's brought battery production in-house. That's pretty cool. Two, he's X'd the dealers out of the equation. That gives him a huge cost advantage over everybody else. And now he's selling OTR services that GM and Ford haven't even begun to think about. And, and so the big hit on Tesla was always the vehicles cost too much and they weren't profitable. And all of a sudden, they don't cost that much anymore, and they have more profitability than anybody else. So Elon, once again, gets the last laugh. <laughs> yeah, and you mentioned that there are a lot of, you know, other companies trying to follow in the footsteps. And I think, you know, Tesla was a little bit unique in the fact that they didn't have to compete with Tesla when, you know, they entered and went through this journey. Um, I know you guys are more early stage, and uh, maybe you don't have any strong thoughts in, on this area, but What's kind of your perception, Ben, as, as we see these other companies, you know, heading down this path? Well, let's break it into two buckets. First, 
it is harder to make electric cars than anybody understands. I know the, the time it takes to manufacture, set up a plant in America, it's huge. You can do it much faster in China, which is why Elon built the facility in Shanghai and is doubling the capacity of it as we speak. It's not doubling down in Fremont, it's doubling down there. Um, and ultimately, the laws of economics have not changed. Uh, you need to get big numbers, you know, fast growth and, and profitability. And I will just suggest, my opinion alone, that Rivian, Lucid, these cars are so, valuation is so far beyond where they are, it is laughable. Uh, you know, they have valuations of roughly 40 and 60 billion respectively, and they each sold 2,000 uh, together, uh, fewer than 2,000 cars last year. And it's just going to take them a couple of years to catch up. And in Lucid's case, you have to ask yourself, who, how big is the market for a $160,000 car? And they'll say, no, no, we're bringing out 120. We'll see. How big is the market for a $120,000 car? Right. And so Elon just has this huge advantage in battery cost. Huge advantage now in economies of scale and manufacturing facilities. It's going to be hard for any of these young upstarts to catch up. Second, Ford and GM are way behind. You know, they were watching this for years before they moved. And just picture this. Last year, Tesla sells 930,000 electric vehicles. Second place, Volkswagen at 425,000. And all of my friends in America are like, well, isn't GM second or third? They're not in the top 10. They did 25,000 and 27,000 vehicles respectively. Compared to 930,000, that's a joke. And here's the sad thing as an American. General Motors started making EVs with the Volt 12 years ago. And after 12 years of toiling in the vineyards, they sold 25,000 last year. I would humbly suggest that's a pretty big disconnect. So when you say, oh, how quickly is Rivian or Lordstown or these other guys who's going to catch up. It's harder than it looks. And you got to give uh, credit to Elon that he's been lashing everybody on, which is why the uh, executives seem to turn over more rapidly. But whatever the heck he's doing, they're moving pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. We're interesting. Enter, entering a really interesting period of time now where, you know, it's, it's off of just press releases and we're getting into production, getting into profitability, and we're getting to start to see, you know, these valuations that these automakers have been given have to start to be justified at some point. Otherwise investors are just going to get fatigued and, and drop off. And I think we're going to, you know, start to see that over the next year or so. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Let's talk about short term and long term. Short term, the hit on Tesla was like, well, they're a cool company, but they're not really selling anything like GM or Ford. Well, here are the numbers. Tesla in 2020 had revenues of 32 billion. That's not a small company, that's a big company. But the big question then is, and how quickly are they growing? Because you know GM and Ford are growing 5% a year, some negative 2%, some, but it's, it's single digits and it's small. Tesla just went from 2020 to 2021 from 32 billion to 53.6 billion. That's a huge number. That's 60% growth. No one in the entire auto industry is doing anything close to that. And here's the kicker. They had 5.5 billion in profitability. GM, Ford, not even in the ballpark. And then you got to ask yourself, well, gee whiz, this sounds like a real number, but it's a crazy multiple. You know, call it a trillion dollars off uh, 50 that billion that's 20x the average auto company is 4x or 5x but what you have to say is what's next year going to be and here's a spoiler alert elon said 50 percent growth on revenue i'm here to tell you it's going to be more like 65 percent they're going to end this year i think it, the analyst average is 82 billion i think they're going to be closer to 88 billion they're pressing right up against 100 billion and then all of a sudden their revenue multiple is going to be 10x, not 20. And 10x versus four for a firm that's growing 60% versus a firm growing 4% that's more profitable, who are you going to buy? And the answer is going to be Tesla. So I think the price, share price, 
that a lot of people thought was nosebleed high is actually going to turn out to be a bargain, uh, especially at $850 a share. Crazy as that sounds. <laughs> You're preaching in the choir with this audience. We've gone through that multiple stuff quite a few times, and it's um, it's compressing fast, like you said. I mean, we started last year at above 1100 you know, price to earnings ratio, and now it's, like you said, below 200 um, and then quickly falling, you know, every every single year from here because if you get 65 percent revenue growth on the size of business that tesla is obviously the bottom line is going to grow much more quickly and like you said that's you know just incredible growth so and it just gets better as they add on more OTA services and at the same time people are paying a lot for the brand i mean you know gm electric brand Nissan, uh, Toyota, I mean, they were, they were living in denial. Uh, so they're in pretty good shape. But the big question then comes is, so who's going to knock them off? And I think there's two credible challengers. One is Volkswagen. Herbert Dies is a man on a mission. And he alone got this. He's got an interesting battery agreement with Nordvolt. So he'll have the advantage of sort of in-house battery production. He's got a global network. Uh, you know, at 425,000 units sold last year, he towers above everybody else. And what Volkswagen's really good at is producing lower cost, high quality vehicles. So if he can kind of own the lower market, that's his gambit. Let Elon have the higher end stuff, be the apple of the industry. Um, but the real challenger, I think, may be the Chinese. And they're thinking the same thing. And you see NIO, Liato, SEIC, BYD, all coming in, and they've got three advantages. One, China makes most of the world's batteries. Two, the Chinese government is subsidizing said batteries, and that just gives the Chinese a real advantage. Three, it's the largest auto market in the world, so they can start out, and they're pretty much copying uh, Tesla. If you see Xpeng, you'd say someone must have left the design on the desk at the Shanghai factory. It appears to have reappeared at the Xpeng. Um, <laughs> So I think they're going to have relatively high quality. You know, within a few years, it'll take a while. Uh, lower cost vehicles that look good at a very interesting price. And what's going to shake things up in the U.S. for the first time, starting in 2023, you will see some of these Chinese brands hitting our shores. And it'll be just like it was when the Japanese showed up in the, in the 70s and the Koreans in the uh, 80s and 90s. People say, oh, they're sort of crappy and eh. And five years later, it's going to be, oh, my God, they're eating out uh, our business. So get ready for that. Uh, we need Elon to stick around to keep us ahead. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see. Do you think they'll come in sort of with the brands that they have established in China? Or do you think they'll sort of, you know, try to partner or develop new brands? Well, do you have any thoughts on that? Because uh, I fully agree with what you're saying. Like Volkswagen China, definitely the areas of, you know, my attention in terms of competition. I think, you know, uh, there's all question of geopolitics here. And so if, if China invades uh, Taiwan, they're not coming here with anything. But uh, assuming there's still stability, um, I, I think they'll tailor the brands to the U.S. market. They can obviously sell at a price point that's much higher here than in China. Uh, they're going to have to go through rigorous uh, safety and NHTSA standards. Uh, but I think they'll hit the market with pretty attractive products at a very good price point. The big question is, what will they do with the dealer networks? And I think if they're smart, they'll take a lesson from Tesla's playbook, probably develop it themselves and try to do as much online as humanly possible. But the whole service thing, making the cars and shipping them here is the easy part. They're going to need to figure out uh, service and sales. And I have no doubt they can make great vehicles. Figuring out service and sales to the U.S. market is a little harder for that. Yeah. I'm curious, did you see Ford's announcement? Um, I know this is relatively recent, but did you see their announcement about splitting splitting up their you know divisions? Of course. Are you kidding? Recent? It happened over 24 hours ago. Uh, <laughs> I know you're up on it, Steve. That's the old, uh, that's old news, pal. No, yeah. so first, it, 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 so Ford's got two companies. It's really just two divisions for now, but it's a harbinger of things to come. I think it could be two companies. And first, it was really smart because these folks have to start moving faster. And I think they just looked at each other and I'm guessing the young folks at Ford said, we got to separate the two companies. The culture here is not going to allow us to move as quickly as we need to an electric smart move. I, I wouldn't want to be 
investing in the old Ford shares, frankly, Ford Peru, I believe. Um, second, it's going to be a lot easier for them to raise money once they complete a spin out. And so I think for those two reasons, it was pretty darn smart. And it's just a, a realization that a given culture that worked really well for 100 years isn't working so well for the future. It's back to my dad versus uh, Steve Jobs uh, thought process. Yeah. Do you think that that's going to give them, you know, this is a question that I had about it was um, you were mentioning the dealership and the service models. Do you think that that's going to give them a little bit of flexibility to pull away from that model? and? Tying that to Tesla, then I know there's a lot of states that Tesla can't establish as many service centers or sell directly like they would like to. If Ford kind of pulls in that direction, that could also open up things for Tesla a little bit too. Um, that's going to be interesting to see. It, it'd be very controversial if the uh, Ford E, right? So it's um, Ford Model E, which is confusing. Uh, it would be a bold move if they said we move this kind of about four dealers, but that would not be a crazy thing to do because the dealers take a big piece and there's going to be cost of competition here. But even for 4D, the big issue they're going to have to solve is who's their battery partner and can they bring the cost curve down enough? And this again, if people are going to be writing books about this, is how the hell did Elon get the cost curve down so quickly? What he's done. I, I, I'm married, so I marvel at this, but it's it's what I call battery promiscuity. He, he's close partners with Sanyo, LG Chem, CATL. He's with everybody. And as much as Americans like to complain about the Chinese stealing our technology, I just have to wonder how much of the battery technology from CATL, <laughs> LG Chem, and Panasonic is finding itself in the new battery designs at Tesla. But I believe, I don't have any inside knowledge, his long-term goal is to take battery production fully in-house. And he's already developed the uh, uh, the 4680 technology, which I think is going to give him yet another advantage. Getting back to the point, it, it, Ford should have done what they're doing five or eight years ago. And it's going to be hard for them to catch up. Chinese, with a lot of government subsidies, it's going to be a lot easier. Yeah. Um, do you think that, so you mentioned like a harbinger of, you know, future change. Do you think that Ford is eventually trying to just split these out completely as, you know, separate companies? Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people are going to want to be a company, in my humble opinion. I, I hope I'm wrong. It's a lot of employees. Uh, it'll be a disintermediation of the American industry. But the big issue looking ahead and everybody's consumed with Lordstown and Ford and the, this new company, the Electric Hummer, the market's not big enough for all of this. And if you look back at what's really going on, everything was moving toward ride hailing. You know the facts here. Average American vehicle is used 4% of the day, 3 to 4%. Ride hailing vehicles can be used 60%. We're all trying to deal with global warming. If you can have that many fewer cars, you don't need more cars. And the rub is, you know, Uber and Lyft are amazing. COVID had so if people stopped using them for a bit. That's coming back quickly. But the real aha is within five to six years, you're going to see super low cost autonomous vehicles without drivers. Not next year or the year after or the year after, but six, eight years out, and then all of a sudden, everybody and their brother, because let's be honest, there are not a lot of 80-year-olds using uh, autonomous ride hailing, uh, but younger people are completely comfortable with it. And if you make the experience better, quicker, cheaper, who's not going to use that? And that means the number of vehicles that get sold is going to shrink. And that means, you know, Tesla's first place, and other people figure out who's going to be in second or third place, but not going to matter who's in 11th, 12th, 13th. Those auto firms are going to be in a world of hurt. Yeah. On, on the autonomy stuff, how do you feel like Tesla's progressing there? Um, I know you guys are invested in, in Luminar I saw too. That's a <laughs> Tesla followers have strong opinions on, on LiDAR, obviously based on Elon's comments, obviously it can be used for other things too, but obviously you guys follow the space a little bit too. So what are your thoughts in general? Yeah. So look, the big debate is how soon can you go autonomous? LiDAR is essentially the eyes of autonomous vehicles. 
Um, and it's taken longer than everybody thought because of three things. One, no one wants to drive around with something that looks like a box of Kentucky Fried Chicken on the road. It's not happening. So you had to shrink the form factor. It's something that's like more the size of uh, an iPhone or a pack of cigarettes. And it's got to be small enough. It can be built in the roof of the vehicle. That is why Luminar is succeeding. They develop a smaller form. Second thing it must have is at least 250 meters of vision in fog, rain, snow, night. So for a human being, our eyes only need to effectively need to be able to see 50 or 100 yards because we don't move that quickly. But if you're moving 70 miles an hour, 250 meters is the minimum. Luminar and LiDAR does that. And the third thing is you got to bring the cost down uh, to about 500 bucks a vehicle or you're not selling many. And Luminar is the first firm that checked those three boxes. And that's why of, I think, the seven public LiDAR companies, Luminar has about half the market. And they now have a number of design wins with firms like Mercedes and Volvo. Uh, because you don't really matter as a LiDAR company until Volvo or Mercedes says, we're putting your Daimler, we're putting you into all of our vehicles. And the minute that happens, because you're... If it's going to every vehicle, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of units, then you're really doing something special. So to the Elon debate, will cars have LiDAR? I think they will. I, I think when Elon began thinking about this and sort of locked in, and one thing about Elon, when he locks in, he hates to let go and say he's wrong ever. Um, LiDAR was so expensive, about $25,000 a unit just three years ago. That's a non-starter. $500 a unit works. It's just there's a lot of grinding of the gears to get from $25,000 to $500. Um, I think Elon's mistaken on this. I think a lot of Tesla engineers know it. I know they bought uh, Luminar technology. I have a hunch that you will see LiDAR at a certain price point find its way into Tesla because they do not want to lose their leadership. And I'll also tell you Waymo and the other major players are already on LiDAR. So We'll see. I could be wrong, but uh, I'm willing to make a bet on this one. In fact, I think I've made a multi-million dollar bet on it. <laughs> yeah, it'll be very interesting to see see how that plays out. Um, a couple areas that I'm curious to get your take on, shifting back to just kind of the where we started began the conversation in terms of these industries that have been a little bit more conservative, slower moving. Obviously, energy has been a little bit of a part of that. Um, what are your thoughts on Tesla's energy business? Particularly, I'm curious about like the solar roof, since that is a little bit more of an you know, earlier stage type of product. Yep. So it's booming. And let's go to the, the 30,000 square feet first. Elon is brilliant because he realized, it took a while, but he realized he wasn't just in Tesla, wasn't just in the auto business, that they could be selling solar for the energy and power walls for the storage. And so they're now in buildings, energy, and mobility. That is a big deal because customers want a turnkey solution. And it gets back to what I was saying on the campaign trail in 2002, the world would like to move to a place where you never have to pay a penny for electricity or gas again. That's what Elon's selling, not cars or power walls or solar. He is selling that vision. He's the only one today doing that. So we have a lot of utilities and investors, and virtually every one of them is saying, what should we do? And the answer is, you need to provide that same easy turnkey solution. You can do it because you already provide the power, and you can help people with power walls. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a Tesla power wall. There's a lot of competing brands. And then you can take the customer back. But I want to pause on one thing. They're not just doing solar. They're showing up and they're already licensed as a utility all over Europe, started in America and in China. And what they're doing is they continue to bring the cost of power storage down is providing a uh, auto bidder software on your phone so you can decide where you are power and increasingly it'll be in stored power from large batteries, whether they're Tesla's or someone else's. So what he's doing is pretty path breaking. 
it's still not quite as big as the car group, but just mark these words. When the great shakeout in the auto industry comes, Tesla will be well positioned. But the fact that they've very quietly become a global energy leader is going to keep the value of this company up for some time to come. Very few people talk about this. Yeah, I think we're going to start to see it talked about a little bit more because I know they've been very constrained on that business from an engineering perspective to a product perspective for, you know, since the Model 3 really. And hopefully we're starting to get past that point, at least to some extent. So uh, anything on the solar roof particularly? That's more of a commodity business, but Elon's pretty good at bringing costs down. The only thing I'd observe there is they have a lot of manufacturing in New York, and I don't know if they'll be able to stay competitive with what's going on in China. But the big question to reference Wayne Gretzky is, you don't skate to where the puck is, you skate to where it's going. And the answer there is China. And how do you, I think Elon spends about this much time worrying about Ford and GM and a lot of time about China. And I give huge credit to entering the market in China, building that many cars and selling that many there. I mean, that took GM and Ford 40 years to do it. He did it in about three. Um, and I think he's thinking, how do we beat them in the energy world as well? That'll be the big question. Yeah, yeah. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. So um, I am kind of curious on your thoughts. You mentioned, obviously, Tesla investing significantly in China, and I think many good reasons to do that, market size being, you know, a huge factor. Um, but I'm kind of curious, just with your background in, you know, government in California, how, how have you felt recently, I guess, kind of a, a broad question, but, you know, we've seen a little bit of a migration out of California and, you know, Tesla has been among that to an extent, at least with the headquarters, um, obviously Fremont still operating Tesla considering expanding it, but yeah, I'm just kind of curious to hear your thoughts on, on all that. So look, um, first overarching thing, you know, for anybody listening, they're going to say, my God, who is this Tesla fanboy? He just loves Elon. Full stop. I'm impressed with him. And I recognize him as a historic figure and someone who saw the future first. He can also be a huge pain in the ass to deal with. There's huge executive turnover. And if there's one area where I would you know, grade him down a bit, it is on dealing with governments because he issues ultimatums. And eventually, you know, I, I think the SEC and other governments are likely to not back down and then he's going to have a problem. And we'll see how that shakes out. There's discrimination, employee discrimination lawsuits. And, you know, my advice, and he's not asking me for advice, but if he did, it would be continue to innovate, outrun the Chinese, and you will have done something extraordinary you already have. Don't get caught up in unnecessary battles or pissing matches with the U.S. government. It, it's just a, a lower uh, percentage deal. Um, a lot has been written about the huge exodus from California and California's over, it's all Texas, blah, blah, blah. Here's the facts. California is today the world's fifth largest economy. By 2030, we will have passed Germany to be the world's fourth largest economy. And we have one half the population, 40 million compared to their 83 million. We'll have a bigger economy. And that means for all the things we're screwing up in California, which are plenty, the average California worker is two X as productive it's the most efficient Western European countries. That's impressive. So there's a lot of talk about, well, firms are leaving. Legislature needs to be careful not to raise taxes, and there's going to be a huge blowback. But realistically, not that many firms are leaving. If you look at the top 10 market cap companies in the world, five are California companies of the top 10. Zero in Europe. Zero in New York or Texas or anywhere east of the Mississippi. Um, we're doing pretty well out here. So not that many folks are leaving. What happens is the older firms, Hewlett Packard, Oracle, these are 30, 40, 50, 60 year old firms. Eventually they'll stick an office in Dallas or Denver, but by and large where the new growth is coming here, it's can continue here because even though we have high taxes, what we've really done better than anybody on the planet is invest in a world-class university system co-located with a pretty vibrant venture community. And we're simply put a magnet for the best and brightest people from around the world. We owe it to a lot of immigrants. It's inspiring, yeah. including it by the you're, you're inspiring me. It's, it's a very passionate speech. And I, you know, I like to hear the, I like to hear that side of it for sure. Including the occasional crazy South African. 
who knew <laughs> for sure um that's all been super helpful and interesting i'm i'm curious just kind of like shifting off of tesla and, and we can kind of wrap up here unless there's anything else um you know, you guys are early stage. I'm always curious about early stage stuff. Is there anything, any particular companies or sort of movements that you're, you know, feeling really excited about that people should maybe be paying a little bit more attention to? Yeah, there is um, one thing that's not on anybody's radar screen, and I think you will get it instantly. Everybody in the world is thinking, how do I get to carbon net neutral? Every country, every company, every millennial, it's scary, and it should be. And we kind of directionally know the answer. It's we need to build more solar, and we are, and we need to build more wind mills, and, and we need more EVs. And we get that. I would humbly submit to you that alone might not be enough. And the next chapter is how we need to green the supply chain of every company in the world. And you know what's going on. IBM is saying, we're the greenest company, and Apple is saying, we're green, and you're the Packard. And what really gives me a laugh is Chevron and British Petroleum are saying, we're green. And it's like, you're not green, you're an oil company. This is a disgrace. But the punchline is, and here's where it gets interesting, European Union already has standards that requires these companies to reveal their supply chain traceability. California will probably follow suit in the U.S. Millennial customers are demanding it. So our job as a VC is to kind of see the future first. And so we did a global search over two years ago to identify who is the leader in this really complicated thing, the elaborate software and all sorts of stuff, so that every battery company can say, where do my batteries come from? Not just what country, what mine? And where do all of the initial products come from that are going into our vehicles, our clothes, our, our homes. And this one firm has done something no one else is close to. It happens to be called Circular. It was a firm we found in London. Who knew? It is growing rapidly, and their customer list includes uh, Volvo, Polestar, Jaguar, BHP, Boeing, one of the top five largest companies in the world from Silicon Valley. Um, but just know in the future, just like 20 years ago, the government required every food company to say, what the heck is in the stuff you're eating? We're now going to be saying, how dirty are the products are you selling or how green? And so that's one of the big trend lines to be watching. But people say, what should I invest in, solar or wind? That's commodity stuff. It's capital intense, low margin, China's tough to beat. What we're winning at and where you get the biggest margin why California is staying on top, not Texas, is because we're developing the next new things in what we call the nexus of software, IoT, and big data. That's where the opportunities are. That's why Silicon Valley is still on top. All right. That's interesting. I'll check them out for sure. Um... Steve, it's been great talking with you. Uh, if there's nothing else, you guys can find Steve and Wesley Group uh, at wesleygroup.com, I believe. Is that, is that the correct, correct URL yeah. there? It's just West with an L-Y at the end, wesleygroup.com. I also have to say, I, I do a lot of stuff on CNBC and Bloomberg and a lot of other programs. No one understands this stuff, Rob, better than you do. Your shows are so much more substantive. You are really the top of the pyramid and I, in my book, and I'm just honored to be on. So thank you. Well, that's, I mean, super, super kind words. I really appreciate that. And, you know, I'd echo the same, like I very much enjoyed speaking with you. Definitely would love to have you on again. And, uh, you know, we can keep putting out better substance than uh, CNBC, hopefully. <laughs> Rob, can I get you to promise in front of everybody that you're, you're not going to quit work here and go to work as an analyst at Goldman Sachs for better than <laughs> anybody they have? Steve, you have my word. I will not be an analyst at Goldman Sachs. All right, everybody. Remember this. I don't want to see you in a suit. All right. Thanks, Rob. Take care. Thanks, Steve. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.